Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to our SIMP meeting for March. I'm Remington, one of the SIMP managers. Um, we also have our chair, Tim Walker, who should be here tonight. Um, Secretary and Treasurer, Mona Smothers, who also could not be here. We have Bob Huddleston, Gil Mazzi, Scott Maddox, Bill Bowen, um, Dominic Jackson, Lyle Van Horn. Um, and so we do encourage you to become a SIMTI member if you aren't already. It's really helpful. It helps us um, put on events like this with good food, um, good knowledge. So talk to any of the managers if you're interested in becoming a SIMTI member. All right, without further ado, I'll do my introduction. So this is Jeff Urick. He is the Director of Marketing at Nanosys, Inc. Jeff is a creative professional turned marketer passionate about storytelling and technology. As Nanosys' Director of Marketing, he is responsible for educating brands, consumers, and the creative community about the colorful benefits of quantum dot technology. He dreams of one day ending the scourge of NTSC 1953 color gamut in display marketing. <laughs> when he isn't working, you'll find Jeff cycling around Northern California, playing guitar, or hanging out at the beach with his family. He has a BS degree from the Berkeley College of Music and an MBA from Sioux Falls University Sawyer School of Management. Um, and also thank you to Grass Valley for hosting us, giving us lots of pizza and beer, so definitely eat up and enjoy. All right, thanks for that uh, introduction. Um, it's, can you guys hear me back there? Okay, oh, a little louder? Okay, um, so it's really great to be here. Um, normally I'm speaking to an audience full of display engineers, so this is a little bit of a different audience for us. Um, it's really cool. You guys are the people who help create the content that inspires us to want to make displays better, so it's a really cool audience for us to talk to. Um, so I'm going to teach, talk to you guys a little bit about quantum dot technology today, um, how it works, what it is, how it works in displays, and walk you through a little bit of the roadmap for the future of the technology and how it'll be used in displays um, in the future. So start off with a little short introduction about my company, Nanosys. Uh, we're the quantum dot company. Uh, we're the company that's really leading the development of quantum dot technology for displays. Uh, we were founded in 2001. We have a customer base with many of the top display makers in the world. Uh, we've shipped over 15 tons of quantum dots to date. Um, we're based right in, in, in Silicon Valley, right down the road in Milpitas, California. And that's where we do all of our manufacturing. And we've got about 100 people today. So <clears throat> the core of what we do, we're really a manufacturing company. We're a chemical manufacturing company. We manufacture quantum dots, the best performing, lowest cost quantum dots on the market. We also design components that enable quantum dots to be easily integrated into displays, like our films and some of the other technologies that I'll walk you guys through today. And of course, we keep innovating for our future uh, growth. Um, so where, does, where do quantum dots come from? If you just heard about quantum dots, uh, you know, they were, Samsung launched the first TV in 2015, so it might seem like kind of a new technology, but quantum dots were actually discovered a long time ago. In 1982, Dr. Lou Bruce, uh, working at Bell Labs, uh, made the first discovery of the quantum uh, size effect for quantum dots. And um, uh, it, almost by accident, kind of a classic story, he's looking for you know, semiconductors floating around in liquid colloidal semiconductors, and he finds this quantum size effect. And he's not really sure what it's going to be used for, but he thinks it's really cool. He keeps working on it. He has some grad students, Dr. Olivisados and Dr. Bowendi, who, who continue that work through the 90s. They actually founded Nanosys in 2001, so almost 20 years after the discovery of the technology, Nanosys is founded. Um, and then another 10 years goes by before we really have our first demonstrations of the technology and displays. 2013, our very first product, the Kindle Fire HDX7, comes to market. And if you were at CES this year, there were a ton of quantum dot displays. So since then, the technology has really proliferated, and it's just entering the mainstream market right now. So just this year, you're starting to see you know, quantum dots at, at sort of mainstream prices um, from most of the major brands. So what's that all about? What's, what's this technology all about? How does it work? What is it? Um, start from the very beginning. The first thing to know about quantum dots is they're super, super small. Um, nanotechnology is kind of a fun buzzword, um, almost sounds like something out of Hollywood, but quantum dots are truly nanotechnology. They're two to eight nanometers in diameter. So on our scale here of really small things from a tennis ball down to an atom, we're much closer to an atom. We're just a little bigger than a water molecule actually. So 
incredibly small technology, you know, up to around the, the width of a strand of DNA. Um, and if, if that doesn't sort of drive it home, I'd like to show this picture. This is an SEM image of a single quantum dot, and you can count the atoms here. So anytime you have a thing that you can kind of count the atoms almost on, on two hands, it gives you a feel for it. It's, it's really, really small. Um, and the size is what gives quantum dot kind of their, their superpower. So every quantum dot is a really, really small crystalline semiconductor. So it's actually an active device. And what it does is it's, the semiconductor is fundamentally an energy converter. And quantum dots convert light energy. So they take short, wave, uh, short uh, wavelength, very high energy, short wavelength light, and they down convert it into longer wavelengths. So you see here on the quantum dot on the left is a one nanometer sized quantum dot. It's absorbing a 450 nanometer blue uh, light wavelength and burns off a little bit of that energy and spits off a brand new photon that's 500 nanometers in wavelength and is like cyan in color. A little bit larger dot is gonna make green light at 530 nanometers and yellow and orange and so on. As the dot gets bigger, it burns off a little more of the energy from that short wavelength photon and produces a longer and longer and longer wavelength. What this means is by controlling the size of the dot, we can make any uh, wavelength in the visible spectrum, basically. So it's pretty amazing to be able to control the properties of this little semiconductor just by changing the size of the crystal. Um, it's a really unique thing to quantum dots. The other thing about quantum dots is that they're solution-based manufacturing. So typical semiconductors do not use solution-based manufacturing. Our factory, actually Bill told me this would end up on YouTube. So normally I show a picture of our actual factory here, but uh, we don't want to show that. So uh, I'm showing a, a microbrewery in Sweden. And I'm showing you that because <laughs> our factory looks a little bit like a microbrewery. Um, we grow these quantum dots in big steel tanks, you know, hundreds of gallons, big batches. Um, and how does the process work? So we start with um, some precursor materials, heat and time, and the, the crystal starts to grow. It actually, it's a chemical self-assembly process, right? So the molecules do the work, we like to say. And they start building this crystal. And it gets larger and larger and larger. And when it gets to the right size, we stop the reaction. We actually do that by controlling the temperature. And we get a, you know, hundreds of gallons of crystals, trillions of crystals that are all the same size, plus or minus a couple of atoms in, in diameter. So it's an incredibly accurate process. Um, but the question is, how do you know you got to the right size, right? They're so small, you can't sort of scoop out a batch and kind of take your calipers out and go, okay, these are one nanometer and these are two nanometer and so on. So what we actually do is we shine a short wavelength into the reactor as the dots are growing and we watch the color of light change. And when it gets to the correct wavelength, we stop the growth process. And that's how you end up with a very accurate uh, process. And it's totally automated, so maybe a little different from this microbrewery, but totally automated process. The operator types in, okay, it's this TV manufacturer. They want a 525 nanometer green today, and we make a perfect 525 nanometer green. Um, and I, at first I said it's different from traditional semiconductor manufacturing. When you think of traditional semiconductors, it's a vapor-based process on a wafer, something we've all kind of seen, if you think of you know, how Intel makes a semiconductor. Um, and the, these are grown in atomically flat wafers. Um, but this is, solution processing is totally different scale. So for us to make quantum dots using this type of process, we need 50 square meters to make just one gram of quantum dots. So it kind of gives you a sense of just how efficient the solution-based processing approach is. The other cool benefit of that is you end up with this quantum dots in, in solution, which can be compatible with inks and solvents and photoresists, and we can integrate them into a lot of different uh, technologies from there. So what do you do with this stuff? Um, you've got this really precise optical emitter. It's in a solution. It's very, very efficient. Um, there's a ton of markets, actually, that you could deploy this in. Um, you know, in solar, you could take light from the sun convert it into a band that a solar cell is more uh, efficient at and actually gain some efficiency. You can use it in farming to actually also shape sunlight and improve the plant growth process by putting the band of sunlight where you need it most. Uh, you could use it in image sensors to improve the efficiency, to make near IR sensors, global shutter, some really cool benefits there. 
Uh, you could use it in LED lighting to have a, a better light with more, a more warm red light and from an LED. Uh, but we really like the display market, and that's where quantum dots are today. And that's where you really see uh, quantum dots in the market today. So why display? Uh, there's three main reasons. Um, it's a huge market. Uh, display is a massive, massive market. Uh, quantum dots have three really key image quality benefits here, too. Color chromaticity. Because we can move the wavelength around, we can hit any color gamut that you want to hit. They have very high peak luminance. They're very efficient emitters. And they have this incredibly fast response time, which is great for moving uh, image content. Uh, and they're also very low cost. So a <clears throat> little more detail on the market. You know, we showed the tennis ball and the atom for the small scale. Um, try to have that, too, for the, for the TV market, the display market. It's a, actually a massive supply chain that every year creates enough display area to cover San Francisco two times over with glass. So if you stitch together all the phones, the monitors, the tablets, the TVs, you could cover San Francisco twice over with that area. So it's a massive area. Um, and it's driven mostly by the TV market, where sizes have increased you know, year over year. This year, you know, 75 is like a normal TV size, right? That's almost a standard size now. So. TV is really driving that area of growth. And that's one of the reasons we focus on the TV market right now. So what about, what about the image quality benefits? So we're looking at here a comparison between a white LED, this is the gray line, and the uh, colored uh, line is a quantum dot spectrum. So if you look at the white LED, a traditional TV with a white LED, even a white OLED TV has a similar kind of emission spectrum. You have a blue peak from a blue LED, and you have this broad yellow peak. And you guys know really well at SMPTE that the video signal has really three colors, not two colors, right? And so what you end up doing is extracting the red and the green from this yellow. And it's very lossy. You lose a lot of energy, and you don't end up with great color. When you open your red filter, you just get this tail that's kind of going out into the infrared. It's not very precise. Uh, you get a lot of crosstalk, and you lose a lot of energy. With quantum dots, we can put these peaks wherever you want to, to have perfect color gamut and really, really um, uh, high efficiency. Yeah, but they, also very narrow. they are very narrow. Those are actually, it's a little bit out of date, that chart. So they're actually even more narrow, the quantum dots today. We have materials that are much less than 30 nanometers full width half max in, in their width. Um, we actually have a spectrometer here, so you can come up and measure the, the quantum dots afterwards if you want. Um, so super narrow peaks. And if you look at this um, in a display, if you combine this blue plus yellow with the color filters of a typical display, you end up with a lot of crosstalk. And you can see that this yellow peak in the middle is wasted energy from the, uh, the yellow phosphor. So with quantum dots, you start with the three peaks you want, pass them through the color filter, and you end up with the same three peaks. So it's much more efficient. You can hit much higher peak luminances. And you can hit the color gamut perfectly. So we sort of show here a recipe for how you would hit like the BT2020 color gamut, for example. So you start with maybe a 450 nanometer blue LED, use a 1.5 nanometer diameter quantum dot that's emitting 525 nanometer green, a 3 nanometer dot that's emitting 633 nanometer red, and you end up with this over 90% coverage of BT2020 when you combine that with a color filter. So we can do DCI-P3, Rec. 709, whatever you want to do, we can move the wavelengths around to optimize the backlight for the color filters for the most light out and the most coverage of the gamut. Another benefit of quantum dots that's a little bit less talked about is something we call chromatic response time. And this, is the, this comes from the fact that the quantum dots are so fast. They respond in just nanoseconds. So when you turn a quantum dot on, when you hit it with blue light, the quantum dot emits light within nanoseconds, billionths of a second. So it's incredibly fast. Um, so we turn on the blue light, the red and the green come on instantly. And we're looking at this chart here in a millisecond time scale. So effectively, it's instant. Right? Other kind of wide color gamut phosphors, this is a chart showing uh, europium doped green with a potassium fluorosilicate red emitter. You can see that the green comes on pretty fast in microseconds. The red is taking milliseconds to warm up, and it takes milliseconds to cool down. So you can actually see this even in 24 or 30 frame per second content. There's a kind of a red fringe or a red tail behind moving objects. 
especially if you have full array local dimming backlight, right? As you turn the LED off behind that zone, the red is sort of still ringing there for, for maybe 10 milliseconds. Um, we were able to capture that with a high speed camera and you can see like the leading edge of the soccer ball is cyan, it turns white and then the tail is red. And that's because the red phosphor in this case is too slow. Um, not a too big of an issue for 24 per, per second uh, frame content, but for gamers and for high, uh, higher speed content, this becomes a really big issue. If you want to game at 120 frames per second, you're going to see a lot of this kind of red fringing effect. So you really want to have the high speed from quantum dots for that application. Um, the last thing I mentioned is the, the cost. And you know, today, quantum dots are leveraging this huge infrastructure for LCD. $200 billion of capex in the ground in LCD manufacturing. And that enables us to give great value to consumers. So this shows a kind of pricing comparison for a traditional LCD kind of in this band for 65 inch, you know, a little under 1,000 to above 1,500 last year. Quantum dots now kind of in the middle. Like you can get a quantum dot TV for less than just a traditional LCD um, at the top end of the market. And that's a new thing that started last year. And this year we think it's gonna come even lower. So quantum dot and LCD are almost just gonna be synonymous, just equal in price, um, which is a huge benefit to the growth of quantum dots. And of course you have OLED still up here in the premium segment. So that's a little bit about the technology, why we're in the display market, um, how, do, how does it work? How do you actually put quantum dots in a display? So we have this kind of cool roadmap from starting today, quantum dot enhancement film. This is our product today. This is how we put quantum dots in displays. I'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about QDOG, sort of the next generation of quantum dot on glass, quantum dot color filter replacement or color conversion layers for OLEDs and micro LEDs. And then finally, we'll get to the pure emissive quantum dots. So a little bit like an OLED display, but with a quantum dot as the emitting material. So start with today with QDEF. This is the product that we make today. It's called a quantum dot enhancement film. And this is a uh, two layers of barrier film loaded with red and green emitting quantum dots. And it gives you that pure RGB spectrum that we showed earlier. So how does it fit into a display? Well, a typical LCD display has a backlight. In this case, it's a white LED backlight. It can be full array, local dimming. It could be edge lit, doesn't really matter. You have a diffuser sheet. You have some prism sheets color filter and an LCD um, module, and you get a great picture. We change with quantum dots is we pull out the diffuser sheet and we replace it with this film. We change the white LEDs to blue LEDs and push blue light into the film and it produces pure red, green, and blue light. And you get this really great tri-color spectrum. So actually, can, maybe you guys can't see this over there from over there, but I have a blue backlight right here. And we take the film, Drop it in. Actually, do, I'll do a little spectrometer measurement for you guys right here. When it powers up, you can see that you get this tricolor white light right from the uh, from this way. So you can see, woo, it's falling apart on me. But you got blue light over on this side, and the quantum dots are turning that into white light that's composed of red, green, and blue from the uh, quantum dots. If we measured the front of this quantum dot display over here, you'd see a very similar spectrum. And that's, that's the benefit of the technology, right? The light in the backlight actually makes it out to the, to the user's eye. And that's how you get the very pure color and high peak luminance. This little cutaway view of this film, it's two layers of plastic barrier film with just the resin in the middle, randomly coded quantum dots. So just billions or trillions of crystals at totally at random to make this very uniform white light. Again, it can be used with full array local dimming, can be used with edge light. Either way, you get the same spectrum and you can just drop it in to the LCD TV. And that's the big benefit today, um, is that you don't have to change the LCD manufacturing process at all. You just put the quantum dot film in and you get this big boost in brightness and in color and in response time. The next version of the technology that's actually coming to market this month is something we call QDOG, and that stands for quantum dot on glass. And it's a very similar version of the technology. Um, instead of a QDEF film, we switch to a glass light guide plate instead of a plastic light guide plate. This is a piece of glass from Corning, it's called iris glass. And we actually coat the quantum dots directly on the light guide plate of the LCD. 
This enables us to make a much thinner display. It's basically the same front of screen performance for the user. They still get the same great color and great brightness of quantum dot displays. Um, but because the inside of the display, we can pull out a lot of structural elements. The plastic light guide is a very kind of wobbly uh, component and has a lot of structural supports that make the TV a lot thicker. So typical LCD is about 15 millimeters thick. And with a very rigid glass light guide, we can make it like less than six millimeters thick. Um, so it's a really incredibly thin uh, product. Um, kind of iterative, still LCD, but it's another great example of how the LCD industry is always continuing to innovate, right? So OLED is thin, LCD is like, okay, what can we do to improve? Okay, we'll go to a glass light guide, now we have a six millimeter thick display. The first product is coming to market this month. It's a um, uh, HP Pavilion 27. It's a 27 inch monitor and it's thinner than an iPhone. It's six and a half millimeters thick. So it's a really thin monitor. It's a pretty cool product. Um, again, with our quantum dot technology for a great color. The next step on our roadmap is to go from inside the backlight of an LCD to the front of the display. And this is where you really want to be. In the backlight, we're able to optimize the light to improve the efficiency of the display um, and to make up for the, some of the losses at the color filters. But the color filters are just, they're so wasteful and you just, you really want to get rid of those things, right? And it'd be so much better to put an active emitter layer right at the front of the display. And so the next version of our technology, we're gonna actually pattern and print quantum dots into the front of the display and actually make subpixels out of the quantum dots. So in this case, you'd have a blue backlight of some kind. It can be a blue OLED, it can be a blue micro LED, it can still be a blue LCD actually. And you put red, green, and then the blue is just a pass through. So you actually replace the color filters at the front of the display with an active quantum dot emitter. And I have some examples here. Uh, you guys can come check out and look through the, the loop here and see the actual subpixels up close of the actual quantum dot printed subpixels. Um, we can do it either using photoresist technology, and that's how all color filters and displays are made today, using uh, photolithography patterning. This is a very good process for making very accurate, very high resolution displays. Um, but it's a little bit wasteful because you put down red and then you etch off what you don't need. You put down green, you etch off what you don't need. So we've also developed an inkjet printing capability as well. I have some examples of inkjet printed quantum dots here too. This is much lower cost because you just drop the materials right where you want them. What is the performance like? Well, this is an example here showing uh, the color gamut we can achieve. Today we've done 100% DCI-P3. 80% 2020. We think by the end of this year, we'll be able to do 92% 2020 color gamut uh, with these materials um, using our cadmium free technology. So amazing color gamut. You get higher brightness because you're not losing light at the filter. And you actually get amazing viewing angle. And that's one of the benefits that I didn't realize at first, but because the quantum dots are actively emitting light, Putting them at the front of the display makes it more like a pure emissive display. So even if it's an LCD with quantum dots replacing the filter, you get this really wide uh, viewing angle, which is awesome. Yeah, I think that's a really, it's something we thought about. Um, but we, what we would need is for you guys to come up with a standard that says, you know, uh, let's add a yellow subpixel or a cyan. I think cyan would be one of the more interesting ones, right? Because if you look at the CIE chart, this area is not well served by this triangular gamut, right? So, yeah, if there's a signal, we would be very happy to make a quantum dot to uh, punch out the gamut that way. Yeah? Are you running into the issues uh, viewer to viewer where color perception seems to become an issue? Uh, That's definitely something we've heard about, metamerism. Um, you know, so far the display makers are asking us to go narrower and narrower and narrower. So we're going to just keep pushing that until they tell us, stop, stop, you know, <laughs> too much. Uh, but we haven't seen that. We haven't seen that yet. Um, we're still, you know, a little under 20 up to 30 nanometers in full width half max, depending on which technology you're looking at. So very narrow, but not like a laser. So we're not quite to that level of, of uh, gamut. Right. 
Yes, I mean, BT2020 is composed of, I mean, these primaries are just pure spectral wavelengths, right? So actually, 100% BT2020 is physically impossible with any technology because you, ha you have to nail the wavelength exactly, right? And so even with a laser, it would be hard to do that, and it would be hard to do that without having speckle and other, and other problems. So um, we think that with quantum dots, with filters, we can get to like 97, 98% coverage, basically with the technology we have now. The big miss is in the blue wavelength, and with the color filters today, that's mostly because of the blue crossover. So you run into this problem where the wavelength for BT2020 is such a short green, it's right next to the blue. And the color filters we use today were not meant for that kind of a spectrum coming in, and so they're letting some of that green through and you lose your blue, your blue point. What do you need from us? <laughs> well, if you want to have another span a standard with five primaries or something like that, you know, that's, that would be something that would be really interesting, I think, but you'd have to have you know, cameras and workflows and, and a whole, whole bunch of stuff to actually get that to a consumer to make it worthwhile making a display. I mean, there are displays that use additional primaries, but they just use a bunch of algorithms to kind of say, oh, you know, let's, let's, let's push the cyan. It's not in the signal, but let's, you know, create a new signal over here for that. But um, it'd be more interesting if you had a real basis for it, so. Um, the first question we usually get about this is, isn't this really crazy because blue is the worst emitter for OLED, right? Like blue is, is the worst brightness, it's the worst lifetime. Um, how could you build on top of a blue OLED? You get it with blue LED, blue LEDs are really rugged, they're over 60% efficient, they're, they're, so they're an awesome platform to build on top of, but blue OLED, it's like, man, that's, it's just not going to be bright enough and the lifetime is going to be terrible. So to explain why, we'd like to look inside a, a white OLED TV first, see how that, that TV is made. Um, and the first thing we found looking at this is that actually the color filters in a, in a white OLED TV are actually very wasteful. Um, they're, even, they're very wasteful. They use a lot, lose a lot of light because you want to have, hit DCI-P3 on that TV, but you're starting with that blue plus yellow uh, light source, right? So you have to have very, very lossy color filters. Almost 80% of the light is lost in the, in the um, white OLED TV. You also have a white subpixel to help make up for that loss in light. You can see you've got the two colors coming in, blue and yellow, and you're pulling all the red you can out of that to hit DCI-P3. The other thing that they did to solve the lifetime problem on the white OLED TV is you have three emitters in the emitter stack. You have a blue, a yellow, and then another blue. And you use two blue emitters because the current is what kind of hurts the lifetime for the OLED. So you can run those two at half current and keep your brightness the same. It gives you a better lifetime and, and you don't have to give up on your brightness, right? So we thought, oh, okay. So with a quantum dot set, you could use a similar system, but you'd gain a lot of efficiency by going to an active emitter instead of a passive filter at, in the filter layer. So that buys you a lot right away. And the second thing we realized is you can put more blue emitters. You could put three, you could put four, run them at a third or a quarter of the current, get even more lifetime and drive it as bright as you want to. So that gives the, the TV maker a lot more flexibility. And we actually think this can be done today with the blue emitters that we have today. Yeah. Um, I noticed that you're taking the, the uh, nano dots and you're, oh, thank you so you're much. Uh, pumping them with light. Yeah. Have you did, done any research into pumping them with other forms of energy, magnetic fields, electrostatic fields, or microwaves? Um, and getting to <clears> light? That's an interesting question. Actually, I can't answer some of those for you. Um, but I can tell you that quantum dots are basic, they're basically really good energy converters, right? And so we can take photons in and convert them into longer wavelength photons. You gotta go downhill. You have to start from high energy blue and, and go to lower energy red. Um, we can take, you could actually take photons and convert them into electricity. You can take electricity and convert them into light. And, for, and that's the next step on our, on our roadmap that I'll talk about. So you can actually make an emissive display with quantum dot, with the same quantum dot. So you're using electrostatic fields that... A very similar stack to like an OLED. Yeah, with an anode and a cathode and you, yeah, yeah. So, 
um, they're just fundamentally really good energy converters. And so you can use them a lot of other, in a lot of other applications that way. For the quantum dots, you mean? Yeah. Yes. Um, the shorter you go, the more efficiency you get out of it. Um, but it's not a it's not a, ma a major effect. Um, exactly right. So what we found is you're better off using like a 450 blue or a 460 blue, whatever the blue you want for your front of screen, blue, um, and converting some of that into red and green. You could do like a UV LED and then a blue quantum dot and, a, you know, and do it that way. But you just get, quantum dots are like over 95% efficient. But it's like why have any conversion there if you don't need it? Just use it. Yeah? Conceivably, how bright of a set do you think uh, is achievable with a direct view QLED? Direct view QLED? Uh, emissive QLED? Yeah. Really good question. I don't know. We'll see. But thousands of nits for sure, I would think. Yeah, because quantum dots are super efficient. Um, so it's just a matter of you know, how much current can you push through the back plane and, and get it lit up. So it's ultimately a heat dissipation problem, is that? Correct? I think so. I think the back plane would be more the, the thing that would hold you back than the quantum dot. Yeah. Um, yeah, today the 2019 TVs, we're seeing a few that are like 2,900 nits on the LCD side. Uh, so the quantum dots can take a lot of... Uh, energy and, 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 uh, and light and, and convert that way. Um, and same on the emissive side. Um, so show a little comparison here. Uh, micro LED, that's another application where you might want to have super high brightness. So this gives you another feel for how, how bright the dots can get and how much energy they can absorb. Um, we think the next interesting application would be to put quantum dots on top of micro LEDs. So micro LEDs are super, super bright. They're very efficient. Uh, they have great color performance, um, really fast response time. And the problem is they're hard to make, right? You have to make three separate colors, dice them up, and put them all on the same back, back plane, right? And there's companies out there making micro LED displays, and they're talking about, hey, we're at 99.9% .9 yield. Right? But on a 4K display over millions of pixels, that's like 250 dead pixels or something like that. Right? So that's like the non-starter. Right? So you need to get to six nines of yield for micro LED to work, which is a kind of unprecedented manufacturing process. So we think quantum dots could help here because you could just make blue and pattern the dots right on top of the blue micro LEDs. It keeps it a lot simpler. You have a lot more um, Simpler uh, circuitry to drive it because you're using all the same color LED, so the same voltage across all the LEDs, um, and much cheaper to make. We think this will be a, still a few years down the road because micro LED still has a lot of supply chain kind of stuff to work out uh, before it really becomes a reality. But when it does, we think quantum dots will have a great fit. And we're showing here three micron sized uh, pattern subpixels using quantum dots. So we could make them, you know, as small as you want for, say, a VR application where you can't see the pixel. Um, another benefit of the technology, when the particle's that small, you can actually make the pixel as small as you want, right? Resolution is basically unlimited. So the last step on the roadmap here is to look at uh, uh, what we call quantum dot electroluminescent. Um, somebody else used the QLED term for a different display technology, so now we're calling it QDEL. Uh, for electroluminescent, and this is kind of what you guys were asking about. You have a similar structure to an OLED uh, em emitter uh, with the uh, inorganic quantum dot material in the middle as the emitter layer. Um, it can be very bright. It can be more rugged than an OLED. Um, it has the same color tuning spectral capability. As you may know, OLEDs have a little bit of a broader spectrum, uh, emission spectrum, so they use some tricks like micro cavities and filtration to try to narrow that peak down. Quantum dots just emit a very narrow peak from the beginning, so it's much easier to work with. We're showing here uh, some of the latest uh, performance that we've demonstrated. So over 10% efficiency on all three colors, kind of the right colors. One of the tricky things for an emissive display is getting the brightness, the lifetime, and the color all with the same material. So that's what you see on the blue OLED side. Somebody will put out a press release and say, hey, we cracked the blue lifetime, right? But it's like the wrong color. Right, so you have to get all those things together. And so these are the right color. There's still some work to do. Um, you know, if we look at where 
Fluorescent OLEDs are around 6% efficient, so we're maybe a little ahead of that. Phosphorescent OLEDs are 20% efficient. That's the red and green that OLEDs use today. So we have some work to, to do to improve the efficiency. We think 15% is actually probably a commercial product. Um, but this is still maybe three to five years from commercialization. So we're just hitting some, some really important milestones along the way. We think um, we will show maybe a monitor size display uh, next year with this technology. So again, not a real product, but a big step in that direction. It's, getting, it's a really exciting thing for quantum dot technology. One of the big benefits for this, sure, it will have great color, it will have great brightness, um, same contrast ratio that everybody loves about emissive displays today, but you go back to the solution processing, and this becomes a huge benefit here. So quantum dots today can be printed. OLEDs are using a vapor deposition process, a little bit like that semiconductor process I talked about earlier. It has to be done under a vacuum, um, and it's a very, very tough process. Quantum dots can be printed in open air, they can use things like um, transfer printing, how you silk screen a t-shirt. So we can make very, very, very low cost displays using printed quantum dots. And we think that's what's gonna be really fundamentally disruptive. So why would you do this, right? We have OLEDs, we have an emissive thing. Why would we want a quantum dot? And I think the cost will be a huge benefit. So that's our quick, I think I had 60 slides. I don't know how fast I did that, but uh, walk through all things quantum dot. Um, and I'd love to take some questions from you guys, and if you want to come up and check out some of the demos and, and some of the um, uh, video reel that we have with the quantum dot display here, that'd be great too. Oh, sure, yeah, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. What's the time to half brightness? What's the time to half brightness for the emissive material? Yeah. We haven't announced. Okay. Yep. For the, the uh, filtering materials? Filtering materials? So our materials are, uh, will outlast the TV. Yeah, manufacturers want to see like 50,000 hours um, to not even half brightness, um, and we blow way past that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's the cost of efficiencies getting out of your quantum dots compared to the light going on versus the power light? Yeah, so the quantum dots, um, the quantum efficiency of the quantum dot um, is over 90%. Depends on the material system, but yeah. Well, over 95% in many cases, so they're really efficient. Do you, do you, make, do you make quantum dots that actually are convert? No. All down. All down. So it's, yeah. You've got to take that, kind of roll that energy downhill from the blue spectrum, which is high in energy, and go towards the reds. Yeah. That would be cool, too, though. Yeah. Well, uh, so integrating quantum dots into metamaterials, I don't, I don't know what you mean. Uh, I've, I've seen papers where uh, certain materials are used in very small structures are constructed using photolithography or vapor deposition. Yeah. And uh, when they're made out of specific materials, you can get really bizarre effects when you shine light or other forms of energy. Single, single wavelength cloaking things that are like microscopic. Yeah. It sounds like that's not an area. I haven't looked at that, but um, it sounds like it would be a compelling and interesting, yeah, use for quantum dots potentially. Yeah. In other words, we want to wear our television. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I mean that's kind of what that's kind of what's going on here. I mean, we're gonna be able to make flexible, cheap things. Maybe you can make like a label on a bottle too, or something like that, right? Doesn't it can be you know a single use thing like that? So it opens up a whole new area. What we really want to get to is like you're shopping for your TV in the home you know wallpaper section of Home Depot, and you're just you know unra unraveling this thing. So little ways off, but you know, yeah. Normally, you have a very wide curve. Right. Um, because the sensitivity in the eye is really quite wide, but what happens if you get a narrow 
Yeah, and that's a good question. So basically asking about the width uh, of, the, of the spectral peaks in the human eye and uh, kind of gets to the metamerism a little bit also. And would people see different colors? Um, I, I think this, the simple answer for me on that, again, is um, the industry keeps asking for narrower and narrower peaks uh, from us. So we haven't hit a place where uh, we think that's a, an issue yet. Yes. Well, so there's a, there's a tricky thing. As you push the gamut, it's exactly related to this, right? As you push the color, color gamut wider and wider, you go from 709 to P3, you have a longer red and a shorter green wavelength wise. And the human eye is most sensitive around like 550, 555. And so you're going further away from that. And your NITS number is going down. Right, and TV makers want a higher nits number, which helps you sell TVs. And so, when you have a narrower peak, you so one of the tr sort of easy ways to cheat a higher gamut is just to put your wavelength way out there, and just have a deep, deep red, and that can get you closer to P3. But if you can actually nail the P3 wavelength and put all of your energy closer to 555, you kind of can keep your nits number higher, right? and still hit your color gamut. So you want to get narrower and narrower and narrower and pull that wavelength as close back in as you can uh, so you don't have to compromise on that. The blue uh, light that you're exciting with now, the kind of the spectral length of that now, does that spill over into near ultraviolet? Because near ultraviolet, the human eye, yeah. could be perceived as a brighter blue. Right. Um, most of the the uh, products that we have in the market today, you're asking about the wavelength of blue, um, are in this sort of four, I would say probably 445 to 455 range. And blue LEDs today are very narrow emission, uh, you know, around 20 nanometers. So they're very narrow, um, but they're not quite in that UV, you know, range yet, I would say. Yeah, go ahead. I noticed that the Demo materials for short showing had a sort of opaque yellow tint to them. Yeah. If you wanted to have uh, a piece of glass that's almost transparent, I don't have a number in mind. You know, is, is it possible to do that with, uh, well, with either, either, either using materials that are transparent but are not illuminated with blue light or yeah. with, uh, far enough apart on the dots? that you can still get a decent picture and it's on and see through it. And see through it. So, yeah, so the question is, could you make a more transparent display? We're looking at the QDEF films we have today, and they're almost opaque. You can kind of, you can kind of see through it, right? But they're, they're fairly dense. Um, and could you make something transparent? I think the answer is yes. I mean, if you look at actually the video here, it's a pretty good example. Uh, we're showing some vials of quantum dots here that have a very low... Um, uh, concentration of quantum dots. So when they're not being hit by um, a blue light source, they almost look clear. And when you light them up, uh, you really see the, the, the uh, uh, emission from the quantum dots very brightly. So you could, you could do something like that. Um, but I think you'd need, you'd need, for a display application, you'd probably want a pretty high density of dots. We need it here because um, there's an interesting thing that happens inside the LCD cavity. There's actually a light recycling effect. Um, so when <clears throat> we model inside of an LCD, uh, a blue photon on average will pass through this film seven times uh, before it makes it out to your eye. It goes out of the backlight, it maybe bounces off of a prism film, comes back through, hits the back plane, and comes back, comes back up. Um, so we get kind of seven shots on goal. And that means we can have a relatively, already for us, a relatively low concentration of materials here. But you still need it to be, uh, you know, this level of density to, to have a nice warm white light. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned uh, the next generation, the group of down at 64 uh, with, what do you see with the other <laughs> generations? Oh, what do you mean? The, the... In terms of production with <clears throat> Um, so the question is, the full with half max, where do we see it going? How, how narrow can it go? You know, I don't know. That's a really interesting question. Um, I know that a single quantum dot does have some probability to it. And so it has a kind of bell-shaped curve. 
So it's not like if you had a single quantum dot, it would be laser-like and you'd have just a single, you know, one nanometer emission peak or something like that. So there is kind of a fundamental limit that you push up against, but we're not there yet. So it'd be interesting to find out. Well, I was actually thinking in terms of the physical dimension of the... Oh, of the display. Yeah. Um, so the current uh, QDOG display is... Um, you know, six and a half millimeters thick. When you go to the emissive display technology, um, yeah, I mean, I think you could have something like this. Certainly, uh, you know, we've made flexible um, emitting displays that you can just take and do this with. So it's, it, you know, it can be very flexible. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Solar powered display where you've got quantum dots on one side doing the solar thing will convert the sun that's peak yeah. to, to blue and then hit all that. Yeah. yeah, that's an interesting idea. So, if we made a solar display that's harnessing sunlight and uh, then turning that into the, the light that you need for the display, no, we have not tried that, but that is interesting. That's, that could be cool. Yeah. And that's not going to tickle the solar cells that much. Right. But if you could gap convert the ultraviolet into something, yeah, and so there are, that would tickle the. There are some people that are really interested in this for solar cells. Actually, just because that UV is basically wasted by the solar cell. So you just take, okay, take that and put, where's the band the solar cell wants it? We'll just put it there. Um, and the other one is plant growth, which I think is really interesting where you, there's a lot of research that's been done that says chlorophyll and the plant responds most to, I don't remember what wavelength it is, but somewhere in you know, yellow green or something like that. So we can actually have in a greenhouse, a film like this uh, with one color quantum dot in it that's absorbing some of that sunlight and just that UV and just pushing it over to a band that the plant wants it. And uh, the early research on this is some people that have a grant from NASA that are working on this. And, they want to grow plants on, like on the moon in the base that we're going to make on the moon. And then you want to have all the efficiency you can get, right, from your sunlight. And so it could be really cool. I don't know. We'll see. Some people in Grand Valley. There's a lot of beta sites. That's true. It's true. We'll keep that in mind if we go that direction. Down for me, whichever. <laughs>